Welcome back to episode 18 of the Sleepy Podcast. A podcast so boring that it will send you to sleep. Today I'm reading an article on Wikipedia called BBC. The British Broadcasting Corporation, otherwise known as the BBC, is the national broadcaster of the United Kingdom, headquartered at Broadcasting House in London. It is the world's oldest national broadcaster and the largest broadcaster in the world by number of employees, employing over 22,000 staff in total, of whom approximately 19,000 are in public sector broadcasting. The BBC is established under Royal Charter and operates under its agreement with the Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. Its work is funded principally by an annual television licence fee, which is charged to all British households, companies and organisations, using any type of equipment to receive or record live television broadcasts on iPlayer Catch-Up. The fee is set by the British Government, agreed by Parliament, and is used to fund BBC Radio, TV and online services, covering the nation and regions of the UK. Since the 1st of April 2014, it has also funded the BBC World Service, launched in 1932 as the BBC Empire Service, which broadcasts in 28 languages and provides comprehensive TV, radio and online services in Arabic and Persian. Around a quarter of the BBC revenue comes from its commercial subsidiary of the BBC Studios, formerly known as BBC Worldwide, which sells BBC programming and services internationally and also distributes the BBC's international 24-hour English language news services, BBC World News, and from BBC.com, provided by BBC Global News LTD in 2009. The company was awarded the Queen's Award for Enterprise in recognition for its international achievement. From its inception throughout the Second World War, where it broadcast to help unite the nation, to popularise a television post-World War II era and the internet of the late 21st, so the late 20th and early 21st centuries, the BBC has played a prominent role in British life and culture, colloquially known as the Beeb, Auntie, or a combination of both as Auntie Beeb. So personally, I've never heard it be called that. The birth of British broadcasting in 1920 to 1922. Britain's first live broadcast was made from the factory in the Wireless Telegraph Company in Chelmsford in June 1920. It was sponsored by the Daily Mail's Lord Northcliffe and featured the famous Australian soprano Dame Nellie Melba. The Melba broadcast caught the people's imagination and marked a turning point in the British public's attitude towards radio. However, the public's enthusiasm was not shared in official circles where such broadcasts were held to interfere with important military or civil communications. By late 1920, pressures from these quarters to unleash among staff of a licensing authority the General Post Office was sufficient to lead the ban in order to further Chelmsford broadcasts. But by 1922, the GPO had received nearly 100 broadcast licence requests and moved to rescind its ban in the wake of a petition by 63 wireless societies with over 3,000 members, anxious to avoid the same chaotic expansion experienced in the United States. The GPO proposed that it would be issue a single broadcasting license to a company jointly owned by consumerism of leading wireless receiver manufacturers to be known as the British Broadcasting Company Limited. John Reith, a Scottish Calvinist, was appointed its general manager in December 1922, a few weeks after the company made its first official broadcast. L. Stanton Jeffries was its first director of music. The company was financed by a royalty for the sale of BBC wireless receiving, sets free approved from domestic manufacturers. To this day, the BBC aims to follow the directive to inform, educate and entertain. From private company toward public service corporation, 1923 to 1926. The financial arrangements soon provided inadequate. Set sales were disappointing as amateurs made their own receivers and listened bought by rival unlicensed sets. By mid-1923, discussions between the GPO and the BBC had become deadlocked 
the Postmaster General commissioned a review of broadcasting by the Skies Committee. The committee recommended a short-term reorganisation of licence fees, which improved enforcement in order to address the BBC's immediate financial distress and an increased share of licence revenue split between it and the GPO. This was followed by a simple 10 shillings licence fee, with no royalty once the wireless manufacturer's protection expired. The BBC broadcasting monopoly was explicit for the duration of its current broadcast licence and the probation of advertising. The BBC was also banned from presenting news bulletins before 7pm and was required to source all news from external wire services. Mid-1925 found the future of broadcasting under further consideration, this time by the Crawford Committee. By now, the BBC, under Rees' leadership, had, for had forged a consensus favouring a continuation of the unified broadcasting service, but more money was still required to finance rapid expansion. Wireless manufacturers were anxious to exit the loss-making concentrum with Rees, keen that the BBC be seen as a public service rather than a commercial enterprise. The recommendations of the Crawford Committee were published in March the following year and were still under consideration by the GPO when the 1926 general strike broke out in May. The strike temporarily interrupted newspaper production and restrictions still on news bulletin waived. The BBC suddenly became a primary source of news for the duration of the crisis. The crisis placed the BBC in a delicate position. On the one hand, Reith was acutely aware that the government might exercise its right to commandeer the BBC at any time as a mouthpiece for the governor, if the BBC were to step out of line. But on the other hand, he was anxious to maintain public trust by appearing to be acting independently. The government was divided on how to handle the BBC, but ended up trusting Reith, whose opposition to the strike mirrored the PM zone. Although Winston Churchill in particular wanted to commandeer the BBC to use it to the best possible advantage, Reith wrote that Stanley Baldwin's government wanted to be able to say that they did not commandeer the BBC, but they knew they could trust us not to be re really impartial. Thus, the BBC was granted sufficient leeway to pursue the government's objectives, largely in a manner of its own choosing. The resulting coverage of both striker and government viewpoints impressed millions, of listeners who were unaware that the PM had broadcast a nation at Reith's home, using one of Reith's sound bites and inserted the last moment, or that the BBC had banned broadcasts from the Labour Party and delayed peace appeal by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Supporters of the strike nicknamed the BBC the BFC for the British Falsehood Company. Reith personally announced the end of the strike when he'd marked reciting from Blake's Jerusalem signifying that England had been saved. While the BBC tends to characterise its coverage of the general strike by emphasising the positive impression created by its balanced coverage and views and government on strikes, John Seaton, Professor of Media History and official BBC historian, had characterised the episode of the intervention as modern propaganda in the British form. Ruth argued that it trust could be gained by authentic, impartial news, could then be used impartial and was not necessarily to end itself. The BBC did well out of the crisis, which cemented a national audience for its broadcasting, and it followed the government's acceptance of the recommendation made by the Crawford Committee of 1925 to 1926, and the British Broadcasting Company be replaced by a non-commercial crown chartered organisation, the British Broadcasting Corporation. The British Broadcasting Corporation came into existence on the 1st of January 1927 and Reith, newly knighted, was appointed the first Director General to replace its purpose and stated values. The new corporation adopted a coat of arms including the motto, Nation shall speak, peace unto nation. Radio audiences had little choice apart from the upscale programming of the BBC. Reith, an intensely moristic executive, was in full charge. His goal was to broadcast all that is very de dependent on human knowledge, endeavour and achievement. The presentation of high moral tone is obviously of paramount importance. Reith succeeded in building a high wall against an American-style free-for-all in radio in which the goal was to attract the largest audiences and thereby secure the greatest advertising revenue. 
There was no paid advertising on the BBC. All of the revenue came from a tax on receiving sets. Highbrow audiences, however, greatly enjoyed it. At a time when American, Australian and Canadian stations were drawing huge cheering from their local teams with the broadcast of baseball, rugby and hockey, the BBC emphasised the service was for national rather than regional audiences. Boat races were well covered alongside tennis and horse riding, but the BBC was reluctant to spend its severely limited airtime on football, cricket games, regardless of their popularity. John Reith and the BBC, with the support of the Crown, determine the universal needs of the people of Britain, the broadcast, and according to these perceived standards. Reith effectively censored anything that he felt would be harmful, directly or indirectly, while recounting his time with the BBC in 1935. Raymond Postage claims that BBC broadcasters were made to submit a draft of their potential broadcast for their appeal. It was expected that they tailored their content to accommodate a modest, church-going elderly for a member of the clergy. Until 1928, entertainers broadcasting on the BBC, both singers and talkers, were expected to avoid biblical quotations. Clerical impersonations or references uh, to drink probation of America Vulgar and doubtful matter and popular allu- and political allusions. The BBC broadcast popular foreign music and musicians from its broadcast while promoting British alternatives. On the 5th of March 1928, Stanley Baldwin, the Prime Minister, maintained the censorship of editorial opinions on public matters, but allowed the BBC to address matters of religious, political or industrial controversy. The resulting political talk series designed to inform England on political issues were criticised by members of Parliament, including Churchill, David Lloyd George and Austin Chamberlain. Those who appealed these charts had said said they were opinions of the Parliament were not nominated by party leaders or party whips, thus stifling independent non-official views. In October 1932, the policemen of the Metropolitan Police Federation marched a protest of a proposed pay cut, fearing dissent within the police force and public support for the movement. The BBC censored its coverage of the events, only broadcasting official statements from the government. Throughout the 1930s, political broadcasts had been closely monitored by the BBC. In 1935, the BBC had censored broadcasts of Oswald Mosley and Harry Pollitt. Mosley was the leader of the British Union of Fascists and Pollitt the leader of a Communist Party of Great Britain. They had been con- contrasted to provide a series of five broadcasts on their party's politics. In the BBC, in conjunction with the Foreign Office of Britain, first suspended the series but ultimately cancelled it without the notice of the public. Less radical politicians faced similar censorship. In 1938, Winston Churchill proposed a series of talks regarding British domestic and foreign politics and affairs, but was similarly censored. Experimental television broadcasts were started in 1929, using an electromagnetic 30-line system developed by John Liege Bard. Similar regular broadcasts using this system began in 1934. An expanded service, now named BBC Television Service, started from Alexandra Palace in November 1936 alternating between an improved bard of mechanical 240-line system and the all-electronic 405-line EMI system, which had been developed by EMI research teams led by Sir Isaac Schoenberg. The superiority of the electronic systems or the mechanical system dropped early the following year, with the EMI system the first fully electronic television system in the world to be used in regular broadcasting. BBC versus Other Media By 1929, the BBC complained the agents of many comedians refused to sign contracts for broadcasting because they feared it harmed the artist by making his material stale. And the reduces of the value of the artist and the visible music hall performer. On the other hand, the BBC was keenly interested in a cooperation between the recording companies who in recent years have not been slow to make records of singers, orchestras, dance bands, etc., who have already proved their power to achieve popularity by the wireless. Radio plays were so popular that the BBC had received 6,000 manuscripts by 1929, most of them written for stage and of little value for broadcasting. 
day in and day out, manuscripts come in and nearly all will go out through the post with a note saying, we regret, etc. In the 1930s, music broadcasts were enjoyed great popularity. For example, the friendly and wide-ranging organ broadcast of St George's Hall by London Reginald Fuchs, who had become the official role of the BBC staff theatre organist from 1936 to 1938. The Second World War Television broadcasting was suspended from the 1st of September 1939 to the 7th of June 1946 during the Second World War, and it was left to BBC radio broadcasters such as Reginald Fruit to keep the nation's spirits up. The BBC moved most of its radio operations out of London, originally to Bristol and then to Bedford. Concerts were broadcast from the Corn Exchange, the Trinity Vapel in St Paul's Church, Bradford was a studio for daily service from 1941 to 1945. And in the darkest days of the war in 1941, the Archbishop of Canterbury and Archbishop of York came to St Paul's to broadcast the UK to the world on National Day of Prayer. The BBC employees during the war included George Orwell, who spent two years with the broadcaster. During his role as Prime Minister during the war, Winston Churchill delivered 33 major wartime speeches by radio all of which were carried by the BBC within the UK. On the 18th of June 1940, French General Charles de Gaulle, in exile in London, and leader of the Free French, made a speech broadcast by the BBC, urging the French people not to capsulate to the Nazis. In 1938, John Reith and the British government, specifically the Ministry of Information, which had been set up for World War II, designed a censorship apparatus for the inevitability of war. Due to the BBC's advancements in shortwave radio technology, the corporation should be co- could be broadcast across the world during the Second World War. Within Europe, the BBC European service would gather intelligence and information regarding current events of the war in English. Regional BBC workers, based on their regional geopolitical climate, would then further censor the material their broadcasts would cover. Nothing was to be added outside the pre-orientated news items. For example, the BBC Polish service was heavily censored due to fears jeopardising relations with the Soviet Union. Controversial topics, i.e. the Polish and Soviet border, the resposition of Polish citizens and the arrest of Polish Home Army members, were not included in Polish broadcasts. American radio broadcasts were broadcast across Europe on BBC channels. This material was also passed through the BBC Censorship Office, which surveyed and edited American coverage of British affairs. By 1940, across all BBC broadcasts, music and composers from the enemy nations were censored. In total, 99 German, 38 Austrian and 38 Italian composers were censored. The BBC argued that the Italian or German language listeners would be irritated by the inclusion of enemy composers. Any potential broadcasters said to have pacifist or communist or fascist ideologies were not allowed on the BBC airwaves. In 1937, an MI5 security officer was given permission to office within the organisation. The officer would examine the files of potential political services and mark the files of those deemed a security risk to the organisation, blacklisting them. This was often done on spurious grounds. Even so, the practice would continue and expand during the years of the war later 20th century. There was a widely reported urban myth that upon resumption of the BBC television service after the war, announcer Lindsay Mitchell started by saying, As I was saying before, we were so rudely interrupted. In fact, the first person to appear when transmission resumed as Jeremy Bly. And the words said were, Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Do you remember me? Jasmine Bly. The European Broadcasting Company was formed on the 12th of February 1950 in Torquay, and the BBC among 23 founding broadcast organisations. Competition to the BBC was introduced in 1955 with the commercial network, operated television network of ITV. However, the BBC monopoly on radio services would be missed until October 1973, when under control of the newly renamed Independent Broadcasting Authority, the UK's first independent local radio station, LBC, came on air. As a result, the Pilkington Committee report of 1962, in which the BBC were praised for the quality and range of the output, 
and ITV were very heavily criticised for not providing enough quality programming. The television was ta- the decision was taken to award the BBC a second television channel, BBC Two, in 1964, renaming the existing service BBC One. BBC Two used the higher resolution 625 line standard and had been standardised across Europe. BBC Two was broadcast in colour from 1967 and was joined by BBC One and ITV on the 15th of November 1969. The 405 line VHF transmitted by BBC One and ITV were continued with all the television receivers until 1985. Starting in 1964, a series of pirate radio stations, starting with Radio Caroline, came on the air and forced the British government to finally regulate radio services to permit nationally based advertising finance services. In response, the BBC reorganised and renamed their radio channels. On the 30th of September 1967, the light programme was split into Radio 1, offering continuous popular music, and Radio 2, more easy listening. The third programme to become BBC 3 also offered classical music and cultural programming. The home service became Radio 4, offering news and non-musical content such as quiz shows, readings, drama and plays, as well as four national channels, a series including Radio London. In 1969, the BBC Enterprises Department was formed to exploit the BBC brands and programming commercially of the spin-off products. In 1979, it became wholly owned limited company, BBC Enterprises Limited. In September 1974, the BBC's teletext service was introduced, created initially to provide subtitling, but developed into a news and information service. In 1978, BBC staff went on strike just before Christmas, thus blocking out the transmission of both channels of all four radio stations in one. Since the deregulation of UK TV and radio market in the 1980s, the BBC had faced increased competition from the commercial sector and from the advertiser-funded public service broadcast of Channel 4, especially on the BBC television services, cable television and digital television series. In the late 1980s, the BBC began a process of spinning off and selling parts of its organisation. In 1988, it sold off the Hudson Press Library, a photographic archive that had been acquired from the Picture Post magazine, by the BBC in 1957. The archive was sold to Brain Deutsch and is now owned by Getty Images. During the 1990s, this process continued with the separation of certain operational corporations into autonomous but wholly owned sublimaries, with the aim of generating additional revenue for its programme making the BBC Enterprise, was reorganised and relaunched in 1995, as the BBC Worldwide Limited in 1998, BBC Studios outside broadcast post-production designs, costumes and wigs were spun off into BBC Resources Limited. The BBC research development had played major parts in developing broadcasts and recording techniques. The BBC was also responsible for the development of Nickham Radio Standard. In recent decades, a number of additional channels where radio stations have been launched. Radio 5 was launched in the 1990s as a sports and educational station. It was replaced in 1994 with Radio 5 Live to become the Radio 4 service to cover a 1991 Gulf War. The news station would be a news and sports section of 1997, BBC News 24, a rolling channel launched on the digital television service, and the following year BBC Choice was launched as a third general entertainment channel from BBC, which was renamed BBC Parliament. In 1999, BBC Knowledge launched a multimedia channel, which services available for the newly launched BBC Text Channel had an educational name which was modified later through life to offer documentaries. That's all I'm going to read for now. If you want to hear more, there's a lot more of this article I can read. Uh, Thank you for listening if you got this far, and if you're still awake, remember there is a series of other videos on my channels you can listen to. If you can, please remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment if you want to, and I will see you in the next video, which will...